Hello my friends and welcome to a brand new week and day six of Eat with Sandhya. We have been talking about our relationship with food and demystifying, really getting down to the first principles of food. And we've talked about five days, we've talked over five days, I've shared my five meals with you and hopefully there have been some lessons and insights along the way. Uh, for those of you that asked about previous recordings, I apologize that they're not all up yet. We're staggering them. I, I, I get to them as soon as I can. Uh, uh, and I have a colleague that helps. We will be putting them all up. They will be available for you. As I bring myself to lunch today, I take a moment to again create awareness. It's a great time. Our meal times are a great time to come back to ourselves. And when I do, how I like to do it is just to do a quick body scan almost to like check in with myself like, hey Sandhya, how are you doing? Sub Kheriat, everything okay with you? And as I did that, I realized that I'm actually feeling like a little soreness behind my eyes. I probably didn't sleep very well last night uh, because I had to wake up a couple of times because of people that came, doorbells rang and there were a few interruptions. Now little interruptions in the sleep especially in your deep sleep cycles can be very very disruptive and can leave you a little disoriented now i'm aware that this is making me feel tired today i'm aware that some things are going to seem more effortful today and some of my decision making may not be at its most optimal now we can draw on resources but know that all of these resources the body budget is finite and before I can get that truly deep restorative rest, I am building up a sleep deficit. So some of the things that I will do for self-care today is possibly not take on any additional work if I can help it, uh, uh, say no to socialization, socializing, which might be optional, which in my case is pretty easy, but also to try and perhaps take a 10 minute lie down just to a 10 or a 20 minute nap we know is can be can be not not deeply restorative because you need a full 90 minute cycle to hit deep sleep cycle but it can be quite refreshing and will at least set me up for the afternoon and help me to continue my work today we are talking about our emotional response to food um, i'm not going to go into the psychology of eating disorders that's out of the realm of coaching but uh, and 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 of course these are some things that that can very easily be i won't say the word easily but they can be addressed they can be uh, there can be a lot of healing around it so if you suspect that your relationship with food might be complicated or or really the metric that you need to use is is this making you feel good in the long term or is it making you feel um, guilty or or loathing of yourself or or you know creating an uncomfortable or an unhealthy outcome for you physically or mentally let that be the metric to guide you I always start by saying that food is one of our earliest relationships. Babies within seconds of being born have something called a rooting reflex. So if you if you just sort of like rub their cheek, they will they will root in that direction, uh, uh, presumably looking for looking for the breast, right? And that that attachment that we form is really one of the earliest sources of soothing, of pleasure, of well-being, of nourishment that we have. Um, there are a lot of psychologies around oral fixation that a lot of our, our, our habits are around soothing through the mouth. So think food, think smoking, alcohol, um, some of our sexual activities. The, the mouth is a tremendous and we do know that we have so many nerve endings on the lips, inside of the mouth. We have all of these taste buds and, and, and even psychologically the associations of that sort of attachment, that soothing, that nourishment. Now, while I won't go into the psychology of eating disorders itself, I would like to use a metaphor, and I'm borrowing this particular one from, from Hindu and Buddhist philosophies, the, the idea of koshas or the layers of our identification or identity. Okay. The, the premise of this, and, and feel free to Google the word koshas and look for an image, you'll usually find a person with many layers, right? Uh, you can call them auras or, or, or whatever, but and, I mean, I'm just using it as a metaphor because there's nothing that, that evidences out this that we know of. But let's look at it, look, look at what the message behind it might be. 
that our physical body is the first thing that, that we experience or see, right? So we believe that this is us. Now the physical body is the, it's the most gross of our identities, it's the most solid and, and tangible of our identities in that sense. The easiest to appease, the easiest to pleasure, but also the shortest lived of pleasures and, and like our most obvious attachment. We often believe that I am this body, so anything that happens to this body happens to us. But as we mature, we often are able to create a little bit of distance and we say that, you know what, I can watch myself growing older. I can see these wrinkles come. But does that mean that I am old? Many of us don't feel old, despite uh, the, the biological age or the biological signs of aging, right? Or say you feel you, you, you know, some, some hot water fell on your arm, you're like, oh my God, I'm in pain, versus I know that hot water fell on my arm, I can feel very uncomfortable sensations of burning, of heat, of, of stinging on my arm. My arm is hurting, as opposed to I am in pain. We know again from studies around mindfulness that while the sensation of pain itself is, is very, very real and tangible to us, a lot of our suffering or, us, or our narratives around pain um, can, can be reframed in that sense and mindfulness activities can help, greatly help to, to I, I'll say ac part of it is acceptance, but also that sense of reduction of inflammation. So with a lot of our pain, we don't, rather than think of it as, as like something sharp or hard that's poking us or, or feels like a stone inside of us, a lot of mindful activities are around like softening the edges, making it more amorphous. And while we're not fighting off pain and seeking to repel it and, and throw it out of our bodies, we learn to embrace it and possibly grow around it. So this is how creating a sense of distance from our physical body can be very powerful. Deep, now, that to our food and how this correlates, keep in mind that anything that goes in here brings us instant gratification, but all of that pleasure rarely lasts more than a few seconds. Okay? And then there'll be likes, dislikes, I want, I don't want, I want it to come all the way from, from you know, the other half, or the other, other end of the planet, or I will create all of this devastation, pay all of this money, put in all of this time and effort, just for these few seconds of pleasure. Now, no judgment. My only, my, my only hypothesis is, is that can we lean into deeper sources of pleasure? Do they give us joy for a longer amount of time? Do they make us feel even more nourished than just the food that we're eating that might have some explosive flavors in them or opioid-like flavors or dopamine-inducing flavors in them? Our emotions are deeper than our physical body. Right? So it's like you're a kid with a toy and that toy was like so much happiness for you until you discovered friendship with the, with the kid next door. Now that's emotional. And the friendship with this kid, you were able to savor even after the kid had to go home and you know, mom called, called uh, them home, but you can savor that friendship. It lasts longer, perhaps even a lifetime. Each time you're able to bring, bring up those memories and relive them that emotion is so much stronger. Now, the more esoteric, the more, the, more, the more subtle the layer, the deeper the potential for attachment, right? You might, you might inconvenience yourself a fair bit for food. You'll do a lot more if you're attached to the idea of, the idea of love or that emotion, right? Think of what we do for our um, lost loves or in anger or in jealousy or, or how our emotions can actually devastate us. Deeper still, the hypothesis goes, is our identification with our thoughts. We often believe that we are our thoughts. But much of the Buddhist practice is creating a distance between us and our thoughts. From neuroscience, it's called metacognition. Can your mind, can you be aware that you are having thoughts? And this can be so powerful because when you have an opinion on something, rather than feeling like, oh my God, I'm outraged by this, Reframe it to say that I'm aware that I'm having thoughts about this particular situation. Create a gap and now you can consciously choose a response to it. Because the, also keep in mind that the deeper and deeper the layers are, the subtler the layers are, the more they impact the outer layers as well. Right? My lack of sleep or my disturbed sleep last night is definitely going to make me make poorer food choices. Will compromise, will compromise on, on my decision making ability, on how I interact with, with people today as well. 
So that's the hypothesis. Go ahead, test it out. Deeper still is our wisdom sheath, which is um, like the third eye or you know the prefrontal cortex. Pretty much stays, um, doesn't really want to be pulled into work if there are preset uh, reactions available to us. We need to actually say, knock, knock, wake up, and let's actually evaluate a situation. All right? But that gives us arguably deeper pleasure. Think about the time when you've wanted to lash out at somebody in anger and, and, and chosen the higher path. In that moment, you might have felt like, oh, it would have felt so good if I just said it. But you know in the longer run that, that you've leaned into your better self and, and arguably that's going to make you feel much better. Hmm? Uh, the, the innermost sheath is called the bliss sheath. I'll equate it to our brain in deep sleep uh, where there's not a lot of brain activity, thoughts, dreams going, going on. And, and arguably in, in, in these philosophies, the lack of ego, the lack of busyness, the lack of doingness, the lack of craving equals bliss. So we sense this when we're in deep sleep. We can touch this for moments in meditation. Deep meditators can stay in that space longer. It's called the gap very often. And um, I will say that we can create these moments for us in our everyday life as well. Um, in, in, in the language of breathing meditations, it's usually called the gap between the in and out breath. It's the silence between two thoughts. If you've ever heard of any of these ideas, what they're sort of in, what, what they're all speaking of is that moment when there isn't all of this chatter and craving and, 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 and activity going on. Now, you might argue what will actually make us get up and get out of bed and do things for ourselves. That's a conversation for another day. But trust me, those answers exist as well if you go and look for them. But this frenzy, desire-driven, it's, it's endless is the hypothesis. And you'll see that for yourself, right? If you loved vanilla ice cream, one week later, vanilla ice cream is plain vanilla, boring. You need more and more and more of the same to give you the same kind of hit. So it's going to be much the same with, so we, back to our body and back to our food, um, that, that if we really engage with our food in terms of how it's nourishing us, which we did, we had a few exercises for last time, how we create an emotional angle with that this is my time for myself, this is my sense of enjoyment, or I'm sharing my food with my loved ones, sharing it with loved ones, sharing it with strangers, can be so powerful as well. I, I, I have um, uh, eaten off the dabbas of like uh, watchmen, of uh, watch repair people, of, of people I'm mostly understanding in front of them drooling and they offer and I'm like, yeah, there, there's, there's some wonderful people that stand on the corner of my road and they share food and whenever they see me, they stop me and they share their food. It, it's such a powerful bonding experience in a lot of negotiation work, breaking bread together or, or sitting two, two, two warring factions sitting down together, breaking bread can be very powerful as well. The kind of food that we eat literally will shape our thoughts as well. Eventually, it all comes down to glucose, protein, I mean, the, amino, the amino acids, the carbs, <laughs> all of it that's going, to, that's going to shape our thoughts and our worldview. They don't call it being hangry for nothing. And um, yeah, so all that remains then is to, is to use your basic rules of thumb, um, get the help that you need. Since the time we were born, nobody's actually, you know, we've, we've sat and looked at, we have quarterly reviews at work, we sometimes evaluate our friendships, we sometimes do a cleanse of our Facebook list, but we don't stop to examine the earliest of our relationships, which is that of um, us with food or that of us with ourselves. Why would you not? What could possibly be more important than this real estate that we have right here? And that's what I'd like to invite you. And that's the idea I'd like to leave you with as far as a lesson is concerned. Over to the food that I actually am eating today. So today, my plate is going to look a little different. What I do have is a corn and capsicum um, rice. This is tempered with just a little bit of jeera and green chili. Now, a lot of some vegetables do have protein in them, but I'll say that off my off the plate of quarters, what might be missing on my plate today is a significant amount of protein. So that big question is not going to kill me for starters. Secondly, I will at some point in the afternoon have a, um, a pea protein shake. I have like just half a scoop. Usually I do it after a workout, but I didn't work out this morning. This is a beetroot salad that I 
I don't know where I got the recipe from. You know, sometimes we just walk up to people, like when I'm standing there drooling over somebody else's lunchbox, very often I'll ask them what they're eating, what the vegetable is, and, and get the recipe off of them. This is a wonderful mix of uh, fenugreek leaves, a little bit of lentils, and brinjal. And on top is the curry, which could potentially trap a lot of hidden calories like we spoke about before, but it is a green chili curry. We make ours at home with peanuts and a little bit of coconut, but very little oil. It is still, it is still higher in calories, but again, if there's something that you crave, if it's the curry that you crave, I often say to people, you know, pick the, pick the goodness out of it, fish it out. Uh, if you have to put, put, put things mindfully on your plate, have a little bit of the gravy to give you that pleasure hit, but you don't need to flood your plate um, uh, with it just because that was your habit, right? That said, all that remains is, is for me to start my meal and to enjoy it, and I hope you will enjoy yours as well. Um, and tomorrow, we're gonna be talking about uh, GMO, non-GMO foods, specialty foods, superfoods, organic foods. I'll also touch on some of the meals that we are not having together. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, mm, breakfast, dinner, snacks. And uh, uh, thank you for, for, for the approval of my lunch. I, 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 today was very hard for my mouth to not water because I absolutely love these flavors. And so if you were eating meat, remember that a quarter of your plate would be the meat, right? Uh, or whatever protein you choose. Um, meat has historically been like a like a, uh, a luxury item. It wasn't so easy, far easier to grow a few vegetables than to actually go there and kill an animal, bring it back. So it was always in scarcity. In the last 40 years, with the advent of factory farming, is how meat has become taken like centerpiece on our plate, especially for us regular middle class people, um, but also made it so easily available to us, right? So again, if you want to, if you want to eat more mindfully, think of how you can get the flavors out of it um, without necessarily making it the centerpiece because with it comes several other questions of your choices, right? Whether it's health, whether it's the environment, whether it's compassion, mindful eating, whatever it might be. The bottom line is don't judge yourself, like I said, just be aware. Ignorance is not bliss in this case when it comes to your food because your body, your mind, your emotions will pay the price for it and then the planet as well. Okay, thank you everybody. I'll see you tomorrow and uh, I look forward to getting your questions. I will spend one day answering them, so go ahead and keep DMing me and uh, bye bye until then.